Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrasi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. We provide sustainability risk analysis for investors, banks, and NGOs. And today we will be discussing the issues surrounding palm oil in Africa, what risks companies are, there are facing, and why the industry has been unable to grow. The palm oil industry had high hopes for palm oil production to expand across Africa, but by the end of 2019, concessions across the continent were nearly half of what they were in 2016, and only 8% of those concessions have been developed into plantations, according to recent estimates. Despite its, despite its slow growth, the palm oil industry in Africa has been connected to social and environmental impacts, including land theft, worker and human rights abuses, and illegal deforestation. In this discussion today, uh, CR analysts will talk about why palm oil has struggled to grow across several African nations and why the industry has been unable to address serious environmental and social concerns. For this event, the audience will be on mute. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A function and we will get to them during the Q&A after the presentations. Our main speakers today will be Sarah Dross of Aid Environment, Gerard Reich of Profundo, along with Emmanuel Long, a local activist in Cameroon, and Devlin Kayak of Grain. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Sarah Dross for her presentation. Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, so in the first part, I'm going to look at oil palm land developments in Western Central Africa since the 2000s. Uh, and I will explain why expansion did not go according to plan. Next slide, please. So looking at the overall uh, African continent, uh, Nigeria is, uh, is the largest global producer of palm oil, the largest uh, country in Africa, and it's ranked uh, number five on global palm oil production. Um, also uh, ranking on this global palm oil production are Cote d'Ivoire as the second largest uh, African country. And on the left of this slide, you can see uh, the ranks of the other countries that are producing palm for industrial use. So there's also a lot of uh, smallholder palm producers in, in Africa, but in this report and this webinar, we focus on uh, industrial uh, African palm oil production. So looking at the map on the right side, uh, that gives an uh, overview of the, the African countries that uh, have, have uh, concessions for oil palm plantations in Africa. And mainly looking at the, the countries that are most in the red colors and the, the dark orange colors, that are the countries that have the, the majority of, uh, of concession land. Um, so they are mostly in the DRC in Nigeria, in the Congo, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, but also in Gabon, Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon. Next slide, please. So in the report, we explained that there is a huge uh, discrepancy between uh, concession areas and the areas that are ultimately developed into uh, oil palm plantations. So uh, Western Africa have become the preferred regions for palm oil expansion since the early 2000s. Uh, and it was mainly related uh, to the fact that there are large areas of uncultivated arable land that the environmental regulations were less strict compared to, for instance, uh, how the regulation became stricter in Southeast Asia. Um, there is also favorable soil and climate conditions, proximity to key markets in Europe and Africa, and also governments providing easy access to, uh, to state-owned land. So this actually caused the yeah, the, the largest Southeast Asian corporations such as Wilmar, Saindarby, Gar, that they started moving in in, in the Western Central Africa uh, since the 2000s. And that caused actually a rush of, uh, of land deals that were signed. So between 2000 and 2015, 4.7 million he hectare has been estimated to uh, be under a land deal signed. Um, but the expansion did not go according to plan. That is basically the, the key conclusion of the report. Um, and the data for this was also partly derived from, uh, from grain data. Um, so we saw a drop in concession area of 2 million between 2016 and 2019. 
uh, and 27 large scale palm oil projects. So with large scale, uh, we only mean uh, large scale projects with uh, over 500 hectares of land and also that are led by foreign investors. So the area covering 1.37 million hectares of land uh, failed already in the negotiation phase or was abandoned between 2008 and 2019. And of the remaining 2.7 million hectare that was under concession, less than 10% was converted eventually into oil palm plantations. Also, we found little evidence that there were new large scale deals signed uh, since 2019. So the reasons for this are various, but many point to the fact that there was a lot of community resistance, also with the support of NGOs and land defenders. And today also in this webinar present is, is Grain, um, and they're going to hopefully also tell you more about the community resistance because they have a better understanding on how it's working on the, on the ground. Also, some of these companies, the Southeast Corporation, for instance, they lacked experience and or capacity to, uh, yeah, to basically develop large concessions in the African context. So some of the implications, well, as you see from the, the numbers, there's huge areas of land that could no longer be developed into oil palm concessions. So there's huge areas of so-called stranded lands. Um, also the, the many community company conflicts that exist that can entail a quite high operational costs for companies. And eventually this can also lead into uh, divestment. I think one of the most known example is the divestment of Saim Darby from Liberia in 2020. Yeah, this can also all be quite severe implications. Next slide, please. So only a handful of companies uh, seem to control African uh, industrial palm oil production and will continue to drive expansion, but at a slower pace. Next slide, please. So these five companies, they control an estimated 76, no, 67% of the large scale planted uh, industrial oil palm plantation area in Africa. And they are Sockfin, uh, Wilmar and Olam from uh, incorporated in Singapore, Belgium based Seat Group and Straight KKM. So straight KKM took over the, the plantations of Feronia in, uh, in the DRC in 2020 to uh, avoid bankruptcy of the, of the company. So looking at the second column, uh, you see the, uh, the areas in hectares planted with oil palm. So these numbers were mostly derived from uh, the company or, or company websites. Um, and only the case of Wilmar, they indicated that the number is uh, incorrect, but they did not provide us with, uh, with the correct number segregated for their operations in Africa. In the third column, we see where the, 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 the plantations uh, are based. Um, so Sockfin is largely uh, operating in Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Wilmar in Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria, and Uganda. And Olam, only in Gabon, and Siat in Ghana, Nigeria, and straight KKM and DRC. Next slide, please. So we found indications that uh, these five companies uh, are pursuing expansion, although at the same time, uh, Sokfin and Olam they indicated that they are not recently expanding, so not at this time. Um, however, it is unclear whether they're going to uh, expand in the near future. So if we look at expansion risks at the cost of natural forests, we consider them most pronounced for, uh, for Nigeria. And the reason for that is that uh, Nigeria is actually expecting uh, the largest growth in uh, palm oil production in the near future. And that mainly links to uh, increased government efforts to revive the sector. So Nigeria was once the, the global palm oil producer worldwide, the first one. Um, 
but it is now the ranked fifth and uh, it's even a net importer from Indonesia and Malaysia. And this is uh, linked to the neglectance of the sector. Uh, but currently the Nigerian government is, uh, is increasing its support for the sector. It's uh, providing uh, large loans. Um, and it's also reportedly distributing uh, state forests to international companies for oil palm expansion. So for instance, Sokfin's uh, Okumu Palm Oil Company in Nigeria and Siat's uh, Presco PLC Company, they received uh, loans to, to expand. Um, so apparently there is 120,000 hectares of uh, state forest that is now uh, distributed to companies. Although in the response to a draft version of our report, Sokfin indicated that these state forests are already degraded by uh, illegal logging for timber to the EU. But we could not confirm this uh, on the ground. Next slide, please. So in the report, we mainly assess the operations of uh, Sokfin and Wilmar, since they are the two largest African op operators. And we found uh, numerous social and environmental impacts on their concessions in Africa. Next slide, please. So first looking at uh, Sokfin. So the group has a, 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 is promoting biodiversity, has a uh, deforestation policy. Also recently, uh, some of its uh, African plantations uh, has retrieved RSPO certification. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is numerous reported cases of uh, social and environmental impacts linked to Sokfin. And I'm not going to uh, explain them all in this uh, presentation, but if you go to the report, you will find the description of all the, of all the cases that we found. Um, also, there are no recent publicly available palm oil mill supplier lists of Sokfin. Uh, and on the website, I did not find any online grievance portal, for instance. So there seems to be a gap between its policies and, and the actual practice. So some of these uh, escalated uh, cases of land grabbing and violence uh, are, for instance, linked to uh, Sokfin's Okumu Oil Palm Company in Nigeria, which has been in conflict with uh, several communities already for more than a decade inside the concession. So the dispute is around uh, land ownership and usage rights in the reserve. It's about displacement and uh, alleged use of severe violence. Um, but in response, uh, Sokfin said that the Okumu Forest Reserve was uh, de-reserved at the time of oil palm planting. And that at the time of oil palm planting, there were no communities in the forest reserve, since no community was uh, permitted to reside in the area, according to law. So the other case uh, that I highlight here is the case of uh, Soka Palm in Cameroon, uh, which hopefully also our guest speaker from Grain will, uh, will look into because he's based in uh, Cameroon. Um, but this plantation in Cameroon is also linked to land grabbing uh, and exploitation of local communities. So local villagers report that they can no longer uh, access their land to cultivate food. And there's also indications of uh, sexual abuse of women in and just outside the plantations. Uh, here in response, Sokfin responded that any allegation of land grabbing done by Soka Palm is irrelevant as there was no expansion since the concession was taken over from the government in 2000. Also listed here are some of the buyers of these uh, two um, plantations. Uh, so Friesland Campina, Olam and Wilmar and PZ Cousins are uh, sourcing from Okumu. Uh, and the Soka Palm uh, plantation in Cameroon uh, has buyers, Nestle and Danone, for instance. Also, I want to highlight that, that uh, critics or environmentalists say that actually the, the RSPO certifications of Soka Palm and Okumu are really the best examples of the shortcomings of the RSPO uh, certification. Um, yeah, and that basically they should not have received this RSPO certification. Next slide, please. So moving to Wilmar, that uh, since it entered in Africa has now a footprint in 16 uh, African countries. 
So the company has a solid NDPE policy. It was actually the first one to have a, an NDPE policy since 2013. And that also applies to all its associated companies and to its minority stakeholders. So in Africa, it has one uh, minority stakeholder called Sivka Group, which is a company from Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and Wilmar holds 27% stake in Sivka. Uh, and Sivka runs palm oil operations in Cote d'Ivoire under the name of Palm Sea and in Liberia under the Maryland oil palm plantation. So also in documents, we saw that uh, Wilmar is sourcing 100% from, uh, from Palm Sea in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. So that means that also these uh, NDPE policies apply to these kind of uh, minority stakeholders. Um, and we saw in practice that nearly all African operations and of subsidiaries and associated companies to Wilmar are reportedly linked to land grabbing, human rights violations and deforestation. So again, there are numerous examples in the report, but I just highlight uh, a few here uh, that are linked to escalated cases of land grabbing and violence. So the PZ Wilmar Nigeria is accused of pollution and land grabbing. Uh, Bitco Uganda was sued for land grabs and forest loss. And the Maryland oil palm plantation in Liberia is linked to violations of human rights, for instance. And these are just a few examples. If you look into the report, there's much more. So also what we noticed is that this could also uh, highlight some of the potential shortcomings of uh, benchmarking and ranking. Because uh, for instance, Wilmar scores generally quite high on, uh, on, on benchmarking, like the World Benchmarking Alliance benchmarks and also uh, on the spot palm oil assessment. So on the, the spot assessment of 2021, Wilmar scored more than 91%, uh, which is a really high score. But at the same time, the CIFCA group only scored 16.5%, which is then the partly owned uh, by, the, by Wilmar. So yeah, these ranking systems, they do not link operations while the NDPE policy of Wilmar applies to all its minority stakeholders. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Um, also in the report, we have more examples and details why also uh, Olam, Siat and Feronia uh, are likely non-compliant with NDPE policies. Um, and this is also my personal view, but I feel that, uh, that there is this obscurity in trade relations in Africa that may explain why yeah, these quite severe violations that we have uh, reported in, in, the, in the report seem to remain a bit under the radar. So in general, it seemed quite difficult to, uh, to find trade data for Africa that, are, that is reliety, reliable. It's often even absent, um, but what we did, and that's what you see on the right side is that we looked into the, the palm mill supplier list of all largest commodity traders and also fast moving consumer good companies. And we checked whether we saw uh, any links with, uh, with the palm plantations that we have described in the report. Uh, and you can see then that we find uh, yeah, the quite the quite bigger traders that we all know, like Banjie, Cargill, uh, Danone, General Mills, Kellogg, Friesland, Campina, and also Olam and Wilmar are sourcing from uh, from all these plantations. So by doing that, uh, and also linked to all the social and environmental impacts that we described in the report, they may risk negative reputation impacts. And that can result in non-compliance with, uh, with their own NDPE policies. So that was my part of the presentation. I now hand over to Gerard Rijk from Profundo. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, next slide, please. Um, well, it's, it's, uh, it's good to know who is owning and financing these, uh, these companies active in uh, in the supply chain of palm oil produced in Africa, uh, in particular when these activities can be linked to NDPE violations, because that offers uh, uh, transparency how the financial world can engage and can 
um, intervene? Uh, what, uh, what are the intervention points? Um, please take a look at this, uh, at this graph. It's made by my colleague, uh, Barbara Cooper, and uh, it gives you quite a good insight uh, what the specific uh, levels in the stages in the supply chain are. Um, as you can see, it's the, the plantations. Well, we have those names, uh, as Sarah clearly uh, uh, has shown. Uh, traders, refiners, well, often these are partly the same companies, like Wilmar is also a big refiner and, uh, and trader. Uh, Fast-moving consumer good companies. Well, that's what Sarah also showed. The supply uh, chain, the 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 the, the, mill, the, 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 the mill lists of the of the fast-moving consumer good companies. They offer transparency here. We have biofuel companies, which are also buying increasingly. They are increasing really their their, their share in the palm oil market. The problem here is that they don't have. Uh, um, a mill list. Often they don't have a uh, mill list, and financiers are not really asking it uh, those companies for the for it, and not yet. But it will probably change in the in the future. Well, there are various risks that can be uh, that can be faced by uh, owners and by financiers. That is a stranded asset risk. Um, it's a market asset, access risk. It's a financing risk. And it is uh, it is reputation risk. Um, next slide, please. We turn here to the uh, to the plantations. Who are the top ten finances of the uh, of the leading African palm oil plantations, which were mentioned by uh, by Sarah earlier? And this is the let's say this is the top ten of the of the total of this group of five. And um, what is very uh, uh, correct characteristics of, of this list is that the European banks and investors have nearly disappeared from this top 10. Uh, of course, they are, can still be one of the main financiers of a company like Sockfin or Siat Group. Uh, maybe that is a company like or a financier like, like ING, but they don't, uh, a company like ING does not belong to the top 10 of financiers in, uh, in, uh, of, of, the, of the companies active in in uh, uh, as a plantation in Africa in this in this group of five, as you can see, it are mainly South uh, of, or Asian banks, Southeast Asian banks, and uh, and a few uh, American banks, um, and and uh, HSBC. And if we look to this list of companies, then it's HSBC and JP Morgan. They are really the only one which ask their clients to commit to zero deforestation. So um, really the financing of companies linked to the African plantations are, uh, has moved to, uh, to, to, to finances without an NDPE uh, policy. Um, next slide, please. And well, this slide gives some additional information whether these finances really face an, a large, uh, enormous uh, risk. Well, if we look to, to Wilmar, okay, finances which are financing Wilmar, Wilmar really has a low exposure to Africa. Its assets, African F assets are relatively small compared uh, to Wilmar's total revenue and, and, and asset base. It's uh, the, 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 the revenues that's only uh, 6.3% and, and and the assets are 4.9%. So it's a really it's it's a really low uh, single digit number for Wilma. So if a problem is there, then, then investors will say, well, it's a minor activity of this uh, of this company. If you look to Sockfin, yes, they have a very high exposure to Africa. Uh, that is around uh, uh, while palm oil is 57% of its revenues in 2020. Uh, Sixty-six percent of its total revenues are generated in Africa. So Africa is is large. Palm oil Africa is large, and also of its assets, uh, seventy-six percent is, is based in Africa. But if you really look at okay, to whom are they selling this product? Then only six percent of revenues of of Sockfin are generated in Europe, and that's now exactly the uh, area where a lot of regulation directives on supply chain, on, on due diligence in supply chain, 
is going on. And well, still 94%, they might continue to, 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 to sell in, in, in the global market. So that's also, uh, well, enormously big in Africa, it's still, it's, it's, there is a limited risk. And SOCFIN, SOCFIN has uh, this zero deforestation policy, uh, uh, but well, its main shareholder, uh, Bolloré uh, does not have one. So you can see the, the, the frictions here. If you look to, uh, if, the, if you look to uh, 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 Feronia and, uh, and Sati, it's uh, lack of financial data there. Uh, there's a low institutional investor risk. Uh, the main risk has been for international development banks and they have really lost uh, a lot of money on these, on these uh, on these companies, they have been involved in a very early stage in uh, in financing this kind of in these companies, uh, and later on they have lost quite some uh, some money on this. Um, next slide, please. Um, if we could then go to, to the to the next phase in the supply chain, it is the fast moving consumer good companies, and uh, uh, well, many fast-moving consumer good companies have supply chain links with the African palm oil companies, which which were mentioned. Uh, they include PZ Cousins, Friesland Campina, Nestle, Kellogg's, ADM, Evo, uh, Bunchy, Fuji Oil, General Mills, Grupo Bimbo, Unilever, Mondelez. Uh, they are all linked to 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 to, to, to plantations where we see ESG uh, violations, and well. These companies they face reputation risk, uh, and and if you, and in particular when you know that these companies, uh, fast moving consumer good companies, they are really uh, gaining a lot of uh, or earning a lot of money uh, from embedded palm oil in their products, and that's uh, the details from from that and also the names of the companies you can see in the profit chain report in. Um, uh, on the chain reaction research website of 2021 and this picture shows you uh, how how on a global scale the the, 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 the the gross profit distribution has been between the various states it's plantations smallholders they don't earn nearly nothing last plantations it's seven billion us dollar but if you look to the fast moving consumer good companies that's where the big earnings are it's 20 billion in cross profits on embedded palm oil uh, and uh, also food retailers, food servers, McDonald's, etc. On embedded palm oil, they make the large uh, uh, US dollar uh, uh, margins. And you can see that uh, around 66% of the, of the profits in the uh, value chain of palm oil are generated by uh, global fast-moving consumer good companies and retailers, but also smaller smaller fast-moving consumer goods. It's not all the big ones. Uh, next slide, please. Well, these uh, the, the, these these fast-moving consumer good companies, because while they are, are earning such an enormous amount of money, also the reputation risk is enormous because uh, if their profits are linked more and more to this issue, then also, investors might say, "Okay, this is uh, this is dangerous to be involved, and this reputational risk for companies is gaining more and more uh, attention." And that is because of NGO campaigns. Uh, we are happy with that, uh, but also investors are increasingly looking to 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 ESG. Uh, although uh, looking to the list of attendees today, there is no investor currently looking at this. At this presentation, uh, but they will be confronted more and more investors with uh, regulation uh, on no deforestation and supply chain, and that is, in particular, in the European Union, uh, the, uh, the, the the Sustainable Finance Directive regulation, but in particular the upcoming European Corporate Su Sustainability uh, Due Diligence Directive will uh, really change uh, uh, the attitude of uh, companies and investors uh, and you will see much more litigation upcoming because when supply chains are not clean or are linked to human rights uh, violations or deforestation violations then there will be a problem and 
this is an in, in, very interesting table. You can see that from 2000 to 2018, the impact of reputation risk uh, has increased dramatically. Uh, as you can see, when you are a loser, uh, in 2000, you could still lose 70% of your value, but in 2018, that had already risen to, to, uh, to 20, nearly 30%. And uh, that is because of social media, but also increasingly the NGO campaigns on this kind of issue. And with this, I'd like, like to hand back to Matt or to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Gerard. Now we're going to go to uh, Emmanuel for his presentation. We apologize for this uh, technical difficulty. Uh, Devlin, if you could move forward with uh, your part of the presentation. Sure. That would be yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, unfortunate that uh, Emmanuel can't join. I think that's a, a reflection also of um, the realities on the ground uh, for uh, for communities and uh, community organizers uh, who are working under very difficult conditions, um, who are you know in places where there is very little infrastructure. Uh, these are places like where Emmanuel is, where they're you know. Plantations, uh, Sockman's plantations have been there for, for decades, but where there has been really very little benefits to the local communities. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, the, the level of poverty and the lack of infrastructure and social services is very, very uh, flagrant. Um, and maybe that just points to, I think, an, something else as well that it, it, it bears <clears throat> being highlighted. Um, in that most of the companies that are currently active with plantations in the region are in areas uh, with legacy land issues. Uh, those lands uh, were acquired uh, in many cases decades ago, some under colonial occupation, some under military regimes, uh, and those uh, the conflicts with the communities uh, persist to this day. Um, and that those are the areas that have been uh, heavily targeted as well by some of the uh, the more recent uh, concessions. I see Emmanuel is there, so maybe we can try one more time. Emmanuel, si si tu veux essayer encore de parler? Oui, ça va. Oui, c'est pas maintenant. Uh, bon, comme uh, le dernier panéliste venait de parler. Ici, chez nous en Afrique, nous sommes beaucoup impactés par les agro-industries qui font dans le palmier à huile et le VA, principalement au Cameroun. Et tu, tu peux traduire ou je continue? Oui, allez pour un, un bout et puis je vais faire un sommaire après. Oui, donc ces sociétés sont nouvellement créés, il y a ceux qui existent après les indépendances. Et qu'est-ce que nous, pourquoi nous sommes victimes de non-conformité de ces sociétés? Nous avons, eh, avant les indépendances, il y avait des particuliers qui ont créé des plantations, dont les Blancs venus, les colons qui ont laissé les plantations, et après les indépendances, les États ont décidé de créer des sociétés de développement. Donc, les populations étaient des guépis de leur terre. Et en 2000, il y a eu privatisation. Et après la privatisation, les sociétés sont en train de régénérer les plantations et ils sont en train de s'accaparer de nouvelles terres, c'est-à-dire faire des extensions. Je vais, pose... je vais juste traduire un peu. Merci. Oui, oui. OK. So Emmanuel was just saying that in, in Cameroon and in Africa, there are uh, big impacts uh, from oil plantations and rubber plantations, and that this issue you know, predates uh, independence. So, so before uh, independence, during the colonial occupation, uh, there were plantations that were created. These were then taken by the new uh, independent governments, uh, and uh, there was a, an effort to create these peristatal plantation companies and many people were, were, their lands were taken from them. And then following this, there was a, a process of privatization where many foreign companies came in. 
Alors là, quand ces sociétés sont arrivées, ils ont racheté les vieilles plantations où depuis 2009-2007, elles sont en train de, de régénérer les plantations et ils sont en train de s'accaparer des nouvelles terres où il y a le problème d'accaparement des terres euh, chez nous aussi au Cameroun où les villageois ont été dépossédés de leurs terres après les indépendances et dans les années 2007-2012, les repreneurs sont en train de faire des extensions sur les nouvelles terres où, où les populations en manquent même les terres. Cela nous pose beaucoup de préjudices, que ce soit dans le niveau environnement ou le niveau social, parce que ces sociétés-là ont bénéficié des avantages que les sociétés états ont laissés et ils n'investissent rien aujourd'hui. Pour eux, c'est d'utiliser ce qu'ils ont, qu ont trouvé et de maximiser les bénéfices sans tenir compte des avantages que doivent bénéficier les communautés riveraines de ces sociétés. So, just to say, um, to, to translate, uh, so these companies uh, take, took over these lands and now they are expanding and doing replantings. And this is pushing into uh, the communities who've already lost significant lands. So taking more lands from them and it's causing a lot of uh, conflicts and problems, uh, from, you know, social impacts, environmental impacts. And the companies are also taking out all the profits. So nothing is staying behind the, the communities and they're not, they haven't been investing in, in anything uh, uh, for the communities. Voilà donc le problème que vivent au quotidien les communautés en Afrique et que nos États qui ont donné ces concessions à ces sociétés ne jouent pas leur rôle de gendarme, donc de tirer les oreilles des dirigeants de ces sociétés, de prendre en compte les, les droits des communautés, de prendre en compte la destruction de la biodiversité et la pollution qui est à nos jours les problèmes qui minent les communautés. Ces sociétés, les eaux usées de ces sociétés vont dans nos cours d'eau. Or, le problème d'eau au Cameroun, comme toute société d'État privatisée, l'eau, c'est la vie. Et nos cours d'eau dans les zones rurales où on n'a pas d'adduction d'eau sont pollués par les eaux usées de ces usines. Voilà donc le quotidien des communautés riveraines de ces agro-industries. So the, we have so many problems that we experience on a daily, daily level from these companies. Uh, and the governments are not playing their role that they should be to protect the communities and to protect the environment. Uh, one really important issue is how these companies pollute uh, local water sources. Um, and the local rivers and streams um, are extremely important to the communities because they're, these are places that don't have access to uh, sewage and, and uh, water infrastructure. So the, they depend heavily on the local water sources and these are being polluted by these plantation companies. Les communautés se sont mobilisées pour faire entendre leur voix, pour dénoncer les non-conformités de ces agro-industries. Et notre combat a été relayé par les médias occidentaux puisque les actionnaires de ces sociétés, c'est eux qui gèrent les médias et les médias locaux ne peuvent pas parler de ce qui se passe ici puisque ces médias reçoivent des publicités venant de ces sociétés et c'est par là qu'ils ont de l'argent. Maintenant, les médias occidentaux essaient de relayer le combat, les mobilisations des communautés et il y a de certaines grandes ONG qui essaient aussi de relayer notre combat et cela amène certaines banques qui financent ces sociétés à, à venir parce que ça ne date pas longtemps. La banque ING est arrivée dans mon village pour eh, écouter les communautés, voir si ce que nous dénonçons, c'est vraiment la vérité. On les fait part de ça, mais jusque-là, ces sociétés continuent toujours à avoir du soutien de ces banques mondiales. Il y a des, des organismes de certification comme la RSPO qui continuent à donner ces certifications à ces sociétés alors que eh, les, ces sociétés ne respectent même pas les principes de la RSPO, mais ils arrivent à acheter ça puisqu'ils ont beaucoup d'argent. 
So the communities have mobilized to denounce the companies. Uh, they've had a difficulty with the local media, getting their voices heard in the local media because the local media is pretty much bought by the companies because they depend on these companies for their advertising revenue. Uh, the Western media has covered uh, their, their struggles uh, and certain NGOs have also helped to amplify the, the struggles and, and expose what's been happening. And that has caused some of the investors, in the case of uh, Sokopam, uh, the ING Bank from the Netherlands, uh, which is uh, an investor, did a uh, fact-checking mission and, and coming to the communities and, and talked with uh, Sineparkam and the affected communities. Um, but uh, until now, the, the, those investors are, are, haven't, haven't changed the policy, haven't, haven't uh, divested. And also the RSPO uh, continues to certify these companies, even though there are clear uh, violations of the principles. Um, and this is, these companies have a lot of, uh, of money and are able to, uh, to maintain um, uh, access to the RSPO certification and, and, and uh, international funding. No, on croyait que la RSPO devait, selon ses principes, aider les communautés à sortir des problèmes qu'ils vivent au jour au jour. Mais on a trouvé que la RSO, c'est une certification qui n'a qui pas sa place. Et aujourd'hui, notre combat, c'est de dénoncer la RSPO, puisque la RSPO aide ces sociétés à avoir des crédits dans les banques, à vendre leurs produits bon prix à l'extérieur. Et nous, on continue à mourir localement. So, we... We thought that the RSPO would be something that could be helpful for the communities that could defend community interests. But now we see that it's really just a tool for the companies uh, to use to get more international financing and to sell their products at a higher price. Uh, and it's done nothing to, to help the local communities who are still suffering on a daily basis. Voilà, en gros, le problème que nous vivons, et voilà en gros les problèmes que nous vivons et qu'on souhaite que des telles réunions comme celle-ci peuvent faire un plaidoyer fort pour que ces sociétés-là qui continuent à recevoir des fonds dans les banques de développement, l'Union européenne, la Banque mondiale, le Fonds monétaire international, la Banque africaine de développement, de tirer les oreilles de ces investisseurs qui viennent en Afrique pour s'accaparer nos terres. Et qui viennent en Afrique détruire notre forêt, puisque nous, on connaît aujourd'hui que la forêt du bassin du Congo est convoitée par ces agro-industries, de jouer un rôle important, comme vous êtes en train de le faire, pour nous aider, parce que nos gouvernements sont faibles face à ces géants économiques-là. So, uh, this is, uh, hope helped you to understand the daily realities that we, we face, and we hope that this kind of a, uh, a, a, a webinar or seminar can help to, uh, to draw attention to the development banks, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Union, uh, and others who are involved in financing these companies as to what's happening and to, to, to push them to pull back from, in, from supporting companies who are grabbing the lands of, of, uh, of Africa and who are uh, grabbing the forest, particularly in the Congo Basin, it's become a, a heavy target for these companies. Uh, and we really hope that that pressure will continue because uh, our governments are, are very weak when faced with these, um, these large uh, foreign powers. Si j'ai un dernier mot à dire, c'est... Vraiment, nous, les communautés, sommes abandonnés à nous-mêmes et que le combat que nous menons, c'est pour les générations futures, puisque eh, même nos sites sacrés ne sont pas respectés. Quand ces sociétés arrivent, ils détruisent nos lieux sacrés, nos lieux de culte, nos lieux où on fait la tradition. La forêt est en train de partir, les animaux sont en train de partir. 
l'eau est en train de partir plus que le changement climatique quand la forêt part, l'eau ne monte plus. Nous, on fait ce combat pour les générations futures. Nous, on a eu la chance de voir certains produits forestiers non lignés. Or, oh, ces enfants-là ne vont pas voir ces produits des années à venir. Voilà donc pourquoi nous nous mobilisons pour faire respecter le droit des communautés, pour que la forêt ne doit pas partir. Merci. So just as a last word, um, I'd like to say that the you know, communities have been abandoned to themselves to take this, this, their struggles forward and that they are very much doing this for future generations because they see how these companies have, have taken over even the, um, the sacred sites of the communities and the, um, uh, the cemeteries and others and I don't even respect those areas. Uh, they destroy forests, the, the animals are, uh, forest animals are being lost, the, 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 the plants and others that the communities depend on, the water sources that they depend on, and this will have huge impacts on future generations. So that is, uh, that is why they are, they are leading the struggle for future generations. Merci. Thank you. Uh, th thank you to all of our presenters today, and particularly Devlin and Emmanuel for being guest speakers and for that really important discussion. Um, we have a little bit of time left for Q&A, um, so we can get started on that. Um, first, uh, back, back to uh, Devlin and Emmanuel, if you could discuss a little more about the local community resistance, what's behind it, what have your interactions been like with the companies, and would you say it has been, um, the resistance has been um, successful in slowing oil palm expansion? Alors, Devlin, je veux répondre. Oui, tu peux. Oui, quand il dit la résistance que nous menons par rapport à ces agro-industries, on gagne des points, mais pas des points importants, parce que les terres que ces sociétés-là nous ont récupérées, ils ne sont pas en train de les rétrocéder. Et l'administration ne met pas pression pour que ces terres soient rétrocédées. Ces sociétés, ce que ces sociétés-là font, on les a empêchés de faire des extensions. Ça, c'est des petits points qu'on gagne. Ils font des petits services sociaux, mais ce n'est pas important. L'important chez nous, c'est de respecter nos sites sacrés. C'est de rétrocéder une partie de nos terres. Voilà pourquoi nous, on continue à se mobiliser, parce que l'agriculture en Afrique, non, pense que c'est l'agriculture familiale qui peut nourrir son nom, pas l'agriculture monoculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what Emmanuel just said, just, I think is uh, not only important in Cameroon, but in, in other places, we're seeing the same thing. So in, a, in struggles, as he's saying, in, in the case of Sokopam, yes, the communities have been able to have small victories. They've had um, certain uh, lands that they've stopped from being expanded upon. They've had, uh, you know, they've been able to force the company to provide cer certain social services or, or others. Uh, but these are all just small victories and they are not able to uh, force a, a what they want is to get their lands back and to be able to produce, do their own food production, to have access to um, to, to produce in uh, ecological ways. Uh, and I think, you know, just adding to what Emmanuel was saying, many of the struggles are focused on either defending lands or on getting their lands back from those uh, companies who've already taken them. Uh, so those, those are struggles that, that continue. In some cases, for instance, not so far from Silkopalm, uh, you had the struggle uh, against the uh, Heracles farms uh, a very successful case with, with strong community resistance. And there are other cases like that, but these are long-standing conflicts and the communities are determined uh, to get their land back. Great, thanks a lot, Emmanuel and Devlin for that answer. Um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about financial risk. Um, a question for you, Harard, uh, reputation risk, could you talk about how they are calculated? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, 
uh, chain reaction research made a, uh, made a large report on how to value reputation risk, and that is on our website. So if you take if you if you tick chain reaction research reputation risk, you will find it immediately on 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 internet. And yes, that is a field which is not yet very much uh, researched uh, how this value can be calculated. Uh, but uh, there are some there are several uh, several um, reports uh, and research already done on this, which shows that it might be uh, significant. And the, the numbers that you saw were based on one report and the, uh, the data you can find, the sources you can find in, uh, in the report. And if you cannot find it, please send me, in, uh, send me in, uh, an email. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gerard. Uh, one more question for you. Um, a company like Wilmar has high ESG rating in some instances, but various reports have also shown that the company has been involved in ESG violations. Can you discuss how um, that contradiction works out for a company like that in the end? Uh, yes, uh, Sarah already referred to this, that, that Wilmar has quite some positive outcomes in ESG ratings. Well, that, that, that is often about tick in the boxes about having an NDPE policy, but often these, uh, these uh, rating agencies don't take into account how uh, really the action on, on the ground is. And well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. We are currently working on a report on Wilmar and this discrepancy, and also to the long list of EC violations that we've seen in in, 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 in the last five years uh, through this company. So uh, we will, uh, in, in, in an upcoming report, we will, uh, we will uh, elaborate on this uh, subject uh, in connection in relation to Wilmar. And if, if anybody has some additional information about Wilmar, please send it to me. Then we can take that into account in our report. Great. Thanks a lot, Gerard. And one more for you. Uh, could you talk about um, European financing in African palm oil? Has it declined? And if so, why? Um, yes, the, uh, it has declined. In two, in, uh, we have looked at two periods. Uh, what we have, what I've shown on the sheet, that was the period 2017-2021, I think. But in the uh, in the years before 2017, the uh, financing was much much larger. Well, and but probably the reason for the fact that it, it has declined by European financial institutions is because of the fact that uh, the European Union is quite, uh, let's say, quite aggressive, and also its financial institutions are, yeah, they are, uh, they are really advanced in uh, in um, in policies on sustainability, and the European Union is quite quite far in quite developed in uh, in directives on sustainability. So that is probably the reason why uh, European financial institutions has drawn back and many of this financing has moved to uh, Asia or to, uh, to North America. Great, thanks a lot for that, Gerard. Um, we're almost at the hour, so we'd like to conclude our, our presentation now. Um, the recording of this presentation will be posted on the website in the next couple of days. We would like to thank all of our attendees and all of our presenters, particularly Emmanuel and Devlin. Thank you very much.